can go live. All right, and we are up here. Welcome, everybody. I have a question to start up our evening. If someone comes up to you, I will be asking my beloved brothers here. Um, if someone comes up to you and tells you, I have no creed but Christ. I have no confession but the Bible. I have no message but love. What will be your response? Okay, brothers? I think the quick and witty response that would come up to my mind would be, well, that's that's one example of a confession and creed, but it's not a very functional, it's not a very good one. Yeah, I, okay. I, I actually agree with that. Uh, there is a cult that have died recently. His name is uh, Eli Soriano. He's one of the biggest cult here in the Philippines. And he, he actually believes that the Bible alone should be our authority, but he is teaching um, uh, contrary to the uh, teachings that the church has confessed throughout history. So how will we know uh, if, if the, what, what he is teaching is correct? So uh, that I, that's my response. Bible, what love? Uh, what Bible? Uh, the, the Bible are held by Roman Catholics. Uh, the Bible plus the Apocrypha is the Bible. The, uh, is it the Bible plus the Book of Mormon? I would say what Christ, the Jehovah's Witness Christ, or the Orthodox Christian Christ. I would say what love, the love, of the love defined by LGBTQ churches, or the love defined uh, by the Orthodox Christian Church on the basis of the Bible for 2,000 years. Yeah, that's just it. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cross Radio. Two thousand years ago, a man hung there on the cross claiming two major claims. One, that he is God, the Lord of the entire universe, and second, that he is the Messiah, the one sent to save his people from sin, death, and Satan. The Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus of Nazareth, lived in human flesh, died, and rose again on the third day. This is the good news about the good God doing the good work of saving sinners for his good name. It's all about Jesus.
Recording in the City of Smiles, Philippines, you are listening to this crosscast episode where we do our very best to lead people to the person and work of Christ through the ministry of His Word. We believe and repent of our sins and yes, follow Him as Lord and Savior. It's all about Jesus. Stay tuned in, listen intently, open your Bibles joyfully, and surrender your hearts fully. This is Cross Radio, the Christocentric word to the Christo-needing world. You know what? Creeds and confessions do not replace the authority and sufficiency of sacred scriptures, nor does it supplement what the Bible might think. We might think lacks. Nope. The Bible is sufficient. The Bible is authority. Creeds and confessions serve as summative statements of what the Bible teaches and are thereby here to shape the church and guard her from further distortions. We live in a day and age where we call this anti-confessional or anti-creedal. We just don't like the sound of some traditional words or statements with some archaic wordings maybe from the 17th century or so we are against its publications in and within even our local churches the bible is my only commander we say love alone is my doctrine jesus is my creed this however is problematic and tonight we will have a glimpse why why do we need to be confessional it to be a confessional church in this anti-confessional age dr sam waldron in his gold standard work A modern exposition of the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith states, quote, We affirm without reservation that the ultimate ground of the Christian's faith and practice is the Bible, not our confessions of faith, but blank. This is the blank that we will discuss tonight. With me are my brothers and, of course, my mentors in the Lord. First of all, we have Dr. Samuel Waldron, the president of Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. He's my professor, and he's the pastor of Grace Reformed Baptist Church. We also have with me, uh, with us, the, um, Pastor Joseph Mangahas. He's the pastor of Cubao Reformed Baptist Church and the host of the new and insightful podcast, In Escuela. Also, we have Jarel Paul Memoria, one of the preaching elders of Reformed Baptist Fellowship Macaulod and host of the Facebook page, Caffeinated Reformed. Again, welcome to Cross Radio. And tonight we will answer a very simple question and we will expound this by getting to the heart of the matter. Why do we need to be a confessional church in this anti creedal age? And we will start with, of course, our first question. I will be asking the guys here. Uh, The first question that we have that we will be discussing is simple, but we need to really lay the groundwork first. What do we mean when we say confessional churches? Okay, what do we mean when we say confessional? And what do we mean when we say anti-creedal age? Okay, what do we mean? when we say confessional and what do we mean when we say anti creedal i will be asking the boys here um what is their say on this we need to define the terms first before we go to our discussion well let me uh, maybe we can start with uh, Uh, Let me just say that uh, when I think of a confessional church, I think of the statement of the Bible, can two walk together except they be agreed. And a confessional church realizes this and says, look, um, uh, the Bible alone is our standard and our authority, but, uh, but if we're going to walk together, we have to agree about what the Bible says. And a confessional church is simply a church this written down what they believe the Bible actually says. Uh, The sad fact is, and it's a fact due to human sin, but it's a real fact, is that people disagree about what the Bible says, and they disagree uh, in very foundational ways. To be a confessional church means to write down uh, and to adopt uh, a creed that everyone, uh, uh, that, that, makes clear what a particular local church uh, conceives the Bible to teach. 
And so that's where I would begin with the definition of a professional church. Okay, so so in summary of what Dr. Walbert actually said, a confessional church are those churches who has written down and has adopted a creed. Right, Dr. Walbert? That's right. Yeah, you can yeah. You can also answer Brother J. Rel. Yeah, I think uh, I, I agree with what Dr. Waldron has said. I think it is a church that subscribe to a certain confession or creed uh, as the basis of their doctrinal unity for the protection of God's church and also for the propagation or the effective propagation of the gospel. So that's how, how I think that what a confessional church is. Yeah, also, and you uh, cannot disagree with Dr. Waldron. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, bro. Yeah, bro. Yeah, bro. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with that. Uh, uh, in a broader sense, of course, uh, we, as uh, Brother Twister said earlier before we uh, went live, uh, churches really cannot help but be confessional uh, in the bro in the broader sense because a community, uh, especially a community united by what they believe, they always have this set of truth claims that define their community. So really, when we speak of confessional churches today, we are referring particularly to those churches who make uh, conscious uh, their acts of confessing as well as uh, they make uh, uh, they, they make uh, an effort to really deliberate what it what it is that they believe uh, in a manner of uh, articulate words uh, and a written document and it is important because the new testament portrays the believing community as a confessing community uh, i think in the philippines uh, we are uh, you, we are uh, used to speaking of confession when we relate that to our Christian faith. We think of confession of sins. But the New Testament speaks uh, of confession also in the sense of confessing truth claims about who Jesus Christ is, what he has done, and all the uh, surrounding truths that are related to what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. So for example, Romans 10 verse 9 speaks of uh, a believer as someone who believes in his, uh, in his heart uh, and confesses with his mouth. Uh, so there is that act of confession that is really uh, quite basic in the uh, in in one's life of faith. So uh, and that is true uh, when we speak of churches. Churches cannot help but be confessing. But it is but when we speak. Uh, of confessional churches in this regard we are referring to those who are conscious of their acts of confessing as well as what it is that they are confessing before the world yeah i just want to uh, say amen to that um uh, that's exactly true all churches all all communities have some sort of creed or confession and uh, what i want to say is amen and uh, it's just a matter of whether we're going to be clear about what that confession is and open to other people uh, to tell them what it is. Uh, and I think it's just just a, a matter of honesty and transparency to be a confessional church. Okay, so it, it is safe to say that every church, if, if you are, if you call yourself an ecclesia or a gathering under the, the word of the Lord, it is, it is natural for us to say that everyone is confessing something. But we have a little bit of a distortion here because um, when we consider ourselves confessional in a way, why is it that this age is called anti-credal? Or what do we mean when we say anti-credal? Do you agree that this um, we live in a day and age of uh, anti-credalism? I think that's indisputable, brother. And uh, what I want to say about that is, uh, why is our day, our day and age uh, anti-credal? I really think it's two things. One, it's very confused. Uh, we have a, we live in a, an, 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 a day and age when which people are really confused. There's a host of conflicting opinions, and people have drifted away uh, from the Orthodox Christian faith under the pressure of all those conflicting opinions. So it comes from confusion, 
But I also want to say that in some cases, it comes from actual hostility to the Orthodox Christian faith and the teaching of the Bible. So people don't want to be confessional, they are anti-creedal because they actually don't believe what the historic creeds of the church say. Okay, that's that's very striking. And uh, do you do you agree with that, Brother JRL? Um, we we are not merely confused, but at the same time we are hostile with what the Bible and how it shaped history. Yeah, I think. Uh, I think when what comes into my mind when we say anti-creedal age is the uh, the spirit of this age that has doubts or has reservations about the validity and the legitimacy of the historic creeds and confession. Uh, I think there are at least three reasons for that. Uh, if I may, if I may share it, I think it is in my experience. Uh, number one, it is a wrong view of sola scriptura. Uh, I, I have met actually people. Uh, that says that sola scriptura means that the Bible is the only book that you will ever read. So uh, they despise commentaries, despise uh, historic reads and confessions because uh, they, uh, under that premise. Uh, but we believe uh, that, uh, as, as Pastor Joseph said, that uh, we, we have a biblical mandate in scripture to have a creeds and confession, to confess what we truly believe. And second, uh, I think it is uh, a wrong view of the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I have a pastor before that told me uh, to stop reading books and commentaries and confessions because our teacher should be the, the, the Holy Spirit and not the confessions of the church. So we should reject that because we have the Holy Spirit. Why do we need to have that creeds and confession if we have the, the Holy Spirit? And uh, I think that pastor missed uh, the, the truth that the Holy Spirit has used teachers and pastors throughout history. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 says that God gave us pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And I think number three, it is a wrong view of unity. I think you uh, we have heard this often, uh, love unites and doctrine divides. I have heard that uh, a lot of times in, in my previous church, uh, in my previous church, uh, so because what churches wants today, especially here in Bacolod City, wants growth of the church attendance more than the purity of the truth. So they reject confessionalism because confessionalism, according to them, uh, divides. Mm. So if we have a confession, it divides the church. So we have to get rid of the confession in order for us to be united in love. So I think that these the, the, uh, people, these leaders, don't simply understand that unity must be based on the truth or truth in love. So we're not denying that we must love, uh, uh, we must exercise love, but that love must be rooted in the truth. So I think that's the that's the spirit, uh, that's the reason behind the spirit of anti credulism I, I, I'm not sure if you agree with that, but that's my uh, humble opinion. I believe uh, Pastor Joseph has something to say. So, uh, I, I agree with uh, what was said. Also, if I may add, I think that uh, especially observing churches here in the Philippines, there are actually uh, the anti-credulism that's uh, coming from the churches here in the Philippines are coming from two fronts. The other is coming from those who are more fundamentalists and uh, they are the ones who would say that liner that uh, you opened earlier, uh, Brother Twister, and that is saying that uh, we have no creed but the Bible. So they think that if you hold to some uh, form of uh, document that is outside of the scripture that compromises the uh, affirmation that the Bible is sufficient. So these are coming from the most more fundamentalist uh, uh, Christians uh, in, the, in the Philippines. But there are those who are uh, the, their opposition is coming from more uh, liberal front, and these are the churches who would exalt tolerance as uh, as their uh, highest uh, virtue, uh, tolerance and inclusivity. And they think that if you uh, if you hold to some if, if you formulate what you believe in some kind of with some kind of formality, then that would automatically exclude those who disagree with you. And they find that distasteful to 
uh, the taste of our age that is uh, they they think a pluralist a tolerant uh, inclusivist so so i think that uh, these are contributing to uh, to the opposition to the creeds uh, yeah I think the four of us will, will agree, and later on we will confess what we have been here. And uh, we now know that uh, being a confessional church does not trump, uh, does not actually um, say that uh, sola sit scriptura, or the scriptures is not enough. In fact, we believe that since scripture is enough, it should shape the church in a way that the, the body of truth in scriptures should be um, systematized as it shapes the churches, even against this, what we call anti-Kino age. So thank you very much, brothers. And we will move to the next questions. Um, the next questions from here will be answered by uh, Dr. Sam. And we will just um, butt in uh, whenever we, we would want to. But the second question here for Dr. Sam is that, can we really be a confessional church in this progressively non-creedal form of Christianity? And why is this necessary? And therefore, why is this beneficial? So this is the question, Dr. Sam. Yeah, that's a, it's, it's a very good question. And, and I think the answer to the question is absolutely yes, and here's why. Because the anti-creedalism uh, of our age uh, is, as I said, uh, based on, uh, in no small part, I think, uh, some very basic confusion that is born out of the relativism, born out of the uh, 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 lack of doctrinal specificity. And, and the fact of the matter is that this leaves a lot of people uh, simply drifting in a vast sea of information with no truth foundation upon which to, uh, uh, upon which to land and to build their lives. A postmodernism, relativism, even, even the uh, uh, minimizing of doctrine that took place through the fundamentalist movement in their in their desire to oppose liberalism, they just uh, uh, emphasized a few very limited truths. All of these things, I think, leave people without a, a, a sense of any foundation for their lives. And uh, what confessionalism uh, gives uh, our age, what it has to offer our age, is uh, a summary of, of the thinking and the coming to clear convictions on the basis of the Bible of what the Orthodox Christian faith is. And it gives people then a foundation upon which to build their lives. It also gives them a community, a community that has a similar uh, beliefs and therefore a community that they can trust, a community that they can uh, they can grow in and thrive in because it's a community that nurtures uh, their understanding and helps ground them more and more in the Word of God. So this is why it's necessary and beneficial. We, I think we live in a sea of people that are, are, are drifting and there is, there is uh, naturally in the human heart a desire uh, for a foundation upon which to build uh, their their lives, and I think that uh, that there is a, a real desire for this. Now, sometimes, of course, since uh, I'm talking about natural desire here, sometimes this uh, produces results that are, are 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 very negative. You see a desire. Uh, you see this desire for a foundation leading some people back to the false systems and the false foundations of Roman Catholicism and Greek Orthodoxy. But what we need to offer them is the right understanding of the historic Christian faith as it's summarized in the great creeds of the church and especially the great creeds of the Reformation. Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Waldron. I, brothers, do you have something to say?
So I, I just want to say, I just want to say that I appreciate that thought that uh, uh, it is in uh, in credulism that actually gives us that stable sense of community and unity among uh, within the body of Christ. So contrary to the idea that uh, Brother Jarel uh, hinted at earlier that uh, for most people, uh, creeds and confessions divide. But in reality, it unites. Uh, it unites those who share this faith before it actually uh, excludes those who who are opposed to it or those who disagree with it. So it is a. It is really a uniting. Uh, it is something that unites uh, more than uh, it actually divides. So it divides necessarily, but uh, to focus on that would be to miss that this is what facilitates true community and unity in the faith. You know, and I want to add just to what I said, bouncing off what you just said, is that uh, in order to have a community in which you can thrive, you've got to be able to trust the other people in that community. You've got to, you've got to know that their fundamental convictions are similar to your own, or you can't trust their example or learn from them because you're always challenging and questioning, are they coming from a completely different uh, source than you are? And so uh, this idea of, of needing to be able to trust our community uh, is confirmed and solidified by its professionalism. And Dr. Walder actually used the term doctrinal specificity just a while ago. And I, I, it's really hard to imagine um, a church with, uh, without any specific doctrinal stand. So the beauty of, of this confessional or being confessional is that it unites the people and not just unites them, but unites them under the ministry of the world as uh, the word as conceived by their creed and confessions. Brother JRL? Yeah, uh, and just to add, um, uh, contrary to me, what what we have discussed, uh, that people think that love unites, doctrine divides. Actually, uh, our, our confessions, our clear confessions, actually deepen our uh, our relationship with one another as the body of Christ. In a personal level, you are we, we are getting getting closer together. Uh, an example of that is uh, Pastor Twister and I. Actually, we are in different church, but. Uh, as well, as soon as we begin, we are uh, we 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 confess the same truth. We actually became close. So uh, it, it is wrong to say that uh, doctrine divides. It actually unites us and deepens our relationship in a personal level. Yeah. Right. And now let's move uh, because uh, I would like to, for us to talk about my closeness with JRL next time. But I will move to question number three. Question number three goes this way. How do we address now the opposition? How do we address the modern or the postmodern forms of Christianity who wants nothing of or is against our orthodox confessional stand? Yeah. Well, um, I guess my first response to this is uh, foundational to our addressing them is making sure that our own confessional churches are wonderful examples of Christian communities. And, uh, and so foundational to everything else is being an example in our churches of healthy, balanced, loving, uh, uh, churches, uh, churches where love is truth shaped, but there's real love, real community, real care for each other uh, on the basis of the Word of God. And uh, uh, that kind of community is uh, to uh, borrow a word from the, do uh, from the doctrine of Scripture. That kind of community is self authenticating. Uh, just like the genuine Christianity of Lois and Eunice, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, was the great apologetic for the gospel and the word of God that they believe. So uh, an, uh, an authentic, truth-loving, healthy, balanced community, uh, uh, community, uh, a church like that is, is the great polemic, the great apologetic for our confessionalism. Uh, now, and it, uh, of course, 
Now, on top of that, in addition to that, we have to fearlessly proclaim what we believe. We have to engage with other people and we have to engage with them and we will engage with them if we're confessional on the basis of uh, an understanding of scripture that is shaped by the best thinking of 2,000 years of church history. Right, and I know my brothers here can, can attest to this because um, Brother J. Rell has been a host for so many times, right, Brother J. Rell? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, but, uh, to, to return to the question, uh, I, I think in, in a practical level, uh, how do we address this uh, anti-confessional uh, age? I think in, in, in our church, for example, we are new to confessionalism. We are a young church. And what we did actually is uh, we go, we are going through right now the 1689 confession. And one of my reference uh, is the book of Dr. Sam Waldron. I am so, uh, I have learned a lot from, from the exposition of Dr. Waldron. So I think, uh, I think it, the, uh, the first step, I think, is to introduce our people, especially to new churches that is that are new to this. Uh, our church uh, and Pastor Twister's church is new to confessionalism. So I think we need to introduce our people to the truths that we confess, okay, to, to, uh, to, to uh, lay to them what we believe and to, uh, uh, and to make it clear to them uh, what our, our, our unity is. believe that's true but uh joseph do you have something to say i just want to second the uh, recommendation on dr waldron's exposition yeah so that is a, <laughs> a staple in our uh whenever uh there are people asking more about uh reformed baptist uh churches and tradition so uh here in our circle uh, that's one of the staple recommendation. Uh, All right. Thank you very much, Brother Joseph. Um, looking at the question here, um, we see the term modern slash postmodern. In a way, um, these terms, if we if we are an avid student of, of culture, we call uh, ourselves cultural hermeneutics at the same time. And looking at the postmodern thinking, it is an attack against the truth by not uh, being shaped by absolute truth anymore. We have what we call now the plurality of truths. So in this question alone, we can see here that the confessions and the creeds who are shaped by, by the very truths found in scriptures um, actually addresses the postmodern mind, right? It addresses the, the thinking of the postmodern man. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, for me, the difference between modern and postmodern is uh, both a similarity and a difference. Postmodernism and postmodernism see uh, uh, look to the human reason for the ultimate source of truth, don't they? The difference between modernism and postmodernism is, is, among other things, that modernism uh, really believed that human reason could get you ultimate truth, and postmodernism doesn't. It believes it can get you to your truth, it can get you to your community's truth, but it really has its doubts about whether you get the ultimate truth. The way that uh, Christianity responds to that is to say, we have an entirely different foundation for our source of truth. We don't look to ultimately to human reason to reach truth in the universe. We look to divine revelation to give us our foundation and it's uh, and the value of confessionalism is that it, it bases what it says on on uh, on that uh, uh, final self-authenticating divine revelation, and and not on human reason. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sam. And to wrap everything up in this uh, question, what Dr. Sam answered just a while ago: How do we address them? Um, Dr. Sam said, since we are talking of community, um, we are still mandated to love, but this love should be truth-shaped 
right? This love should be truth shaped, and and this is how we we actually indulge and engage um, with the Christians, uh, with with the postmodern or modern forms, even of Christianity itself. Now we move to the fourth question, right? The fourth question is simple. But this is quite complicated for some and for most because we are talking of worship. How is being confessional? We have we may have had a, a little bit of a clue while answering it a while ago, but we will center here on worship. How is being confessional helpful to both personal and corporate worship? Right. Well, that's a great question, and I, I suppose there's a, a, a lot of stuff that could be said. But let me just you know I thought of two chapters of the confession. Uh, you know, worship. Worship is directed toward God. And so the first thing we have to know is who is God? And uh, that might seem very basic, but it's also very controversial in our day. And so our confession presents to us with an understanding of God that is very different than popular culture today, very different than the philosophy of the last century or two. Of and and and, uh, and it really teaches classical Christian theism, and and knowing who that God is and understanding the majestic sovereign God of the Bible uh, is just the whole foundation of both our personal and the corporate worship, and informs everything. If you have a changeable, mutable uh, uh, God that doesn't comprehensively even know the future. Uh, that's going to change how you worship God, both personally and corporately. And so, uh, but if you have a God that you believe is absolutely sovereign, uh, who has an eternal plan that he's working out, and that you're included in that plan for good, that even in uh, the worst and most difficult of times, you can say to yourself on the basis of scripture and, and the confession of faith, God intends this for my good, even things as difficult as they are, I can I can worship this God, I can pray to this God, I can trust this God, and I can keep reading the scriptures as my source of of, of salvation and comfort in my life. And and then I think of chapter twenty two, which uh, makes it very clear uh, that uh, that uh, that worship is to be Bible regulated. That, uh, that uh, worship is to always remember that the church is God's house. He arranges the furniture. He tells us what goes on in his house. And we don't have any business uh, of arranging the furniture in God's house or, or creating new paths of worship and ways of worship that are not found in scripture. And so uh, chapter two and chapter 22 of the Confession of Faith are just so foundational, uh, and it seems to me too in this in this day of the pandemic that uh, the the scriptural teaching in chapter twenty six in the doctrine of the church and the way it teaches us that the assembly of the church, uh, indwelt by the special presence of God, uh, is a uh, as has, has the effect of making confessional churches. Uh, urgently draw back together uh, and for to meet together and to assemble together in, in a way that you see, uh, frankly, liberal churches and churches without that foundation not doing. Uh, you know, we were, of course, because of the pandemic, shut down for a couple of months uh, and had to meet online. But uh, the fact of the matter is, there's a church, a liberal church right around the corner and they haven't had services in that building for a year and a half. This speaks to uh, their lack of a truth foundation based in scripture and confessed, confessed mutually by them. Yeah, so so indeed because the, our worship, both personally and corporately, is shaped by the truths found in scripture therefore confession of faith is, is really important you know what I, I for those who are listening here um i haven't asked these brothers of mine my filipino brothers here to answer but these guys are really quick in answering uh i would like to ask them once again this question um brother jrel um do you have something to say 
uh, how is being confessional helpful to both personal and corporate words? I think uh, personally, as a preacher of God's word, uh, and I and I also come from a church that is that does does not define confession. So I, I uh, some of the theology of my previous church uh, I adopted, and w- when I started to to go through the confession, uh, I have to do a lot of uh, to correct correction of my thinking of my theology. So uh, it is helpful for me personally as I preach God's word to 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 ground myself with the with the truth uh, that we have confessed in uh, that is laid out in the 1689 confession so it, it helps me to 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 sharpen my my understanding of god's word and it helps me to to to, pre- to, co- to preach correctly what is uh, uh, what, what is written in god's word uh, through the help of the confession of course and uh for corporate worship I think as we as as the church understands more of the truth of God, the more they will worship uh, uh, God in a in a in a reverential and and truth truthful manner and with respect and with with awe. I think it is help. Uh, I think it is helpful because it helps us to to see God, to look to God, and to look to Christ, and to understand more of the gospel. Hello, Joseph. Uh, I, uh, a verse just uh, came up to my mind, and that's uh, Deuteronomy six verse four. There is here. This is a popular uh, verse, uh, the Shema of the Old Testament. It says, "Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one." So this was uh, when God's people under the old covenant was being constituted as uh, as uh, a people after the redemption redemption uh, in exodus which is the uh, the type of uh, redemption uh, that we have in christ as well uh, they were immediately given a theological identity and that is uh, they were they are the, they are people who confesses the uh, uh, confesses that there is only one god and it is yahweh their covenant god and immediately the the uh, command that followed after that theological identity was given in verse 5 you shall love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might so uh, our practices as god's people should be oriented around uh, what we believe what what is our uh, our identity uh, in terms of what we believe about God uh, and what we believe God has done to us. So uh, I think it, uh, this is a good example of that. So uh, our religious duty, our acts of piety must always must all be oriented to uh, our confession of faith really, uh, what we believe about God and uh, what he has done in redemption. Thank you. Thank you very much, brothers. In fact, um, people are now joining us on Facebook. We have almost 50. We have 49 viewers um, right now. And some of them are asking questions. Um, I don't want to really boggle ourselves down with the questions that we have. But um, there is a question here by uh, brother Sani Roble from from Bacolod City at the same time, who is in connection with this question. Um, he asked the question, uh, this is uh, for Dr. Sam and for, for both my brothers here, how is being confessional um, helpful in evangelism and missions? How is it helpful in evangelism and missions? Um, uh, well, the first and most obvious thing that occurs to me to say is uh, to evangelize, you have to have an understanding of the gospel a right understanding of the gospel. And the church has been thinking for 2,000 years about that right understanding of the gospel. And it's it's not enough uh, for us to just have some general idea of what the gospel is or some experience of the gospel for ourselves. We have to have a, a biblical idea of the gospel. There's nothing more important, nothing more important than a clear and specific understanding of, of what the gospel is and of what it requires and of what repentance is and what faith is and what the work of Christ is and what our hope of eternal salvation is. And 
will we not listen to the great teachers of the church who have been addressing that issue, that that great essential question for 2,000 years in order to inform us of, of, the, of the best way to communicate the, the biblical gospel. Uh, so I think it's important in that way. Uh, uh, another thing that comes out here is who are you going to cooperate with in evangelism? Uh, I, uh, I, this this is a great question, and and I think there are, are, are different levels of cooperation between local churches and Christians um, in, in these ways, and um, and uh, a confessional understanding of the gospel of Christ will, on the one hand tell you that there are some things that uh, we don't have to agree about, at least to do basic evangelism, but there are other things that are absolutely essential to agree about, and the confession is a helpful instructor in terms of making that distinction. We have we have uh, guys that go down to uh, the river park, uh, Owensboro is on the Ohio River, and there's a large park down there where people gather. And sometimes we'll have guys from other churches with us uh, that uh, go down there to evangelize. But uh, uh, we couldn't cooperate with some churches and some men because their understanding of the gospel is clearly uh, different than our own and, uh, and not sufficiently similar that we would feel comfortable cooperating with. So those are a couple of ways in which I would answer that question. Yeah, still how, how we answered uh, the original question here. Um, it helped us um, be united in one truth. And uh, the way we worship, uh, the way we respond to the truth is it's worship. And at the same time, it helps us in evangelizing since we are systematically being drawn to this um, body of truth. Uh, Brother Joseph, do you have something to say? Uh, perhaps we can uh, take the example of the Apostle Paul as well when uh, he was seeking to kind of uh, uh, enlist the Roman church, uh, uh, the Roman believers in his endeavor to spread the gospel uh, uh, towards Spain. Uh, uh, the whole Romans want to, uh, to, to uh, 12 uh, and it, and even after after that, uh, we have the uh, best uh, exposition of the gospel that we have in the letters of the apostle Paul. So uh, he was making sure that uh, these people would be grounded on uh, the basic assertions of the of uh, the gospel truths, uh, because apart from that, it would it would really uh, not be. Uh, it would be best to, to to do that. Paul Paul found it best to do that before actually engaging the uh, evangelistic mission uh, under the sponsorship of the Roman believers. Of course, that mission was not was not what happened uh, afterwards uh, in history, but that was the intention of the apostle Paul. And one of the earliest confessions of the early church was that Christ, uh, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God, which, uh, although in a simple uh, statement, is confessed from mouth to mouth by the early church, by the early Christians. And it is also beautifully crafted in a way that the gospel is, is somehow united under that simple truth. Right, Brother J. Ram? I would like to say amen to what uh, both has said. Okay, uh, so we move to our second to the last question, question number five here. Um, since we are talking of the local churches or a corporate worship, what shall we do now? We are not just here to simply um, boggle down with theological or theological systems or some some truths but at the same time we are here also to help the churches so what is our action plan what shall we do now to help the local churches be confessional well um we've got to uh, in our uh in our own local churches we've got to teach and familiarize people with the confession and uh, if uh 
we do that, it will it will tend to make people excited about how the confession so often uh, states clearly and specifically biblical truth in a way that's superior uh, to the way in which uh, uh, they've heard it stated in the past. And uh, we can also, uh, in our public teaching and preaching, use the confession. We get to a, a subject like repentance, or we get to a subject like justification, or we get to a subject dealing with the person of Christ. And we can point people to the clear, concise, but full statements of the confession of faith. And, uh, and so we can illustrate the usefulness and helpfulness of the confession in our public preaching and teaching. Uh, those are some things we can do to help the local churches be confessional. And then I'll, I'll just hark back to, uh, to what I've said already, and that is we can help other local churches to be confessional by showing uh, the, uh, the wonderful fruits and blessings that develop in a church uh, that practices true shape love and community. Brother Jarrell, I think you're excited to answer. No, I actually have. I have a. I, I'm not sure if we have Q and A later, but uh, I have a follow up question. Is that, if it's that okay, yeah. I have a follow up question. Uh, I. It's, it's speaking of helping the local churches. Uh, nine marks actually is one of the most helpful uh, ministry in in that that help local churches to build uh, health, healthy churches. But I also uh, read an article uh, I think a year ago. Uh, I, I forgot actually the article. I can't find the link. But there is a, an article that that argues that we we should not use the 1689 confession uh, i just recently found out that dr waldron has a response to that in his uh fifth edition i have not yet read that but i, I just wanted to to ask if uh, dr waldron how, how how do how do we uh deal with that or i mean how do we respond to that uh, yeah I have, I have not yet read the the, the uh, response yet yeah well uh, uh Thank you for asking about that. That is, the, I think this is a really important issue. Actually, it's an article I wrote about 15, 16 years ago now uh, in response to uh, uh, when I was doing my PhD at Southern. And of course, Mark Dever is made friends with Al Bowler and would occasionally come and teach classes there. And uh, uh, they uh, put an article on, on their e-journal e uh, by Dr. Sean Wright, arguing that the 1689 was not a good profession for local churches. I don't know what it is good for if it's not good for local churches, but that was the argument. And I asked Mark Dever if I could respond to that article, and he was kind enough to let me respond. And I wrote the I wrote the article that is now uh, one of the appendix appendices of the fifth edition. Um, and they did have it on there for a while. They also, it was also, and you can still find it on, uh, if you search for it on the Founders Journal, so you don't actually have to have the fifth edition uh, to see the article. But to give, you know, there were a lot of things I said in response to Sean Wright, like uh, I wanted everybody to know that the title of my article was not right is wrong. But, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but the key thing that I said, to be more serious, is, look, uh, the whole assumption that uh, to be a member of a confessional church, you have to fully subscribe to confession uh, is simply wrong. And uh, I said, I've been a member uh, now, a uh, pastor now, uh, then it was two, now it's three Reformed Baptist churches, and we've never practiced that. Yes. I think elders should fully subscribe to confession, but the duty of members is simply to submit to the confession. And if people can say, well, I disagree with the confession here or there on a secondary point, but I can submit sweetly, peaceably, and joyfully to its being taught, but then I, there is no bar to there being members of the church. It's only if some professing Christian holds what the confession calls 
an error that averts or overthrows the foundation of the Christian faith that they're barred membership in a confessional church. And so uh, the confession re retains its authority, but, uh, but there's a difference between elders and members. Elders must teach it. That assumes a, a larger degree of, uh, of commitment to the confession. Members must simply submit to it uh, peacefully and sweetly, and, and that doesn't assume the same degree of understanding or even commitment to the confession, as long as the integrity and the authority of the confession may, remains in the church. So does that satisfy your question, yeah. Brother yeah. Gerald? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just a, just a follow. Uh, if I may have a one follow up question, if if the conf if, if the members of the church uh, is not required to fully subscribe to the confession, is there a uh, kind of a uh, guide uh, uh, of what we should the church members should confess? What chapters should they should they uh, subscribe? Uh, what if, for example, they they deny the chapter on justification or they don't believe that? So my question in a, is practical. How do we uh, judge uh, the disagreement of uh, the, the the members of the church? Uh, how do we determine the uh, primary issue and the secondary issues in the confession itself? Yeah. Well, that's a really good question. In some respects, it's a very difficult question. But let me tell you how I thought about it myself. Uh, first of all, uh, the confession clearly uh, uh, assumes a distinction between foundational truths and not foundational truths, doesn't it? In chapter 26, where it talks about errors averting the foundation. It also assumes uh, in that same chapter in almost the same place, uh, a distinction between uh, remaining sin, which is consistent with a credible profession of faith, and reigning sin uh, and a professing Christian, which is not consistent with a credible profession of faith or consistent with membership in a local church because uh, uh, churches must be composed of visible things. So, um, uh, and, and I think the Bible also clearly uh, assumes the distinction between foundational and non-foundational truths. Think of Hebrews 6, uh, where it talks about the elementary principles of the Christian faith and contrast uh, in Hebrews 5 and 6 of, of further further important truths, but, but not uh, but not foundational truths. Uh, think of think of Jesus' response to the man who asked him, what was the first and great commandment in the law? And he doesn't say, hey, you're wrong, buddy. Everything is equally important. No, he didn't say that. He said the first great, uh, great commandment is love the Lord your God. And then he even was willing to say, the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as you tell. He didn't say all 100, 615 commandments of the law are equally uh, uh, central to the Christian or the or the Jewish faith. So uh, that that basic principle requires us to think very carefully about the uh, uh, the whole issue of foundational and non-foundational truth. Uh, errors that overthrow the foundation, errors that do not. And so um, I think that the the, it's very helpful to understand that uh, there are, are like three guides uh, that are not equally important. The Bible itself, uh, in some places, uh, says that certain errors are damnable heresy, okay? It, it speaks of those who deny the second coming of Christ uh, in Second Peter 3 as mockers, which, which is biblical language for someone who's an opponent of the Christian faith. Uh, it, uh, and so there's, there are biblical passages on issues like this that can be helpful in orienting our thinking. Uh, I think there's a logical principle too. Uh, you know, Christians, they disagree about certain things, uh, and, but their disagreement logically assumes 
agreement about more basic issues. Uh, a beautiful illustration of this is eschatology. Uh, what do what do premillennialists, amillennialists, and postmillennialists all have in common? Well, they all have in common uh, that uh, Christ is coming back. They disagree about whether it's amillennially or premillennially or postmillennially, but they all agree uh, in a, a visible second coming of Christ. Uh, and and so there's a there are there are logical there are logical categories that I think the Bible allows us to to. Uh, Thinking. And then we come back to our confessionalism and our creedalism. We go back and, and, and look at uh, the great creeds and confessions of the church. Uh, what did the Apostle Creed? What did the Nicene Creed? What did the Chalcedonian Creed? Uh, what do the great Reformation Creeds say are foundational to the Christian faith? And, and what do they teach, but not uh, with the same kind of uh, absolute uh, uh, necessity, and um, and I think this this is really helpful. Uh, these can, things can be really helpful in uh, in guiding our thinking. Ultimately, of course, it comes down to the eldership of the church to decide whether uh, uh, a, a certain error or misunderstanding or disagreement could be any of those things, and a lot of a lot of times with new members is more confusion. Uh, is and that confusion is consistent uh, with uh, membership in a confessional church. And uh, and there's no substitute, I think, for the judgment of the elders in submission to these biblical, logical, and historical principles uh, on this matter. So that's that's something the way I've I've thought through it. I I can't give you a list. These are essential doctrines. These are not. Now, in the article, uh, I do I do say a couple of things about that, and uh, let me just add a little bit to this. Then, uh, I am a firm believer in particular redemption. I think the confession clearly teaches particular redemption uh, in both chapter three and chapter eight. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the Christian Sabbath and a Sabbatarian without shame, but um, I would not. I would not say that if, if a person can peacefully and sweetly submit uh, to the doctrine of particular redemption, not get mad and disturb the unity of the church when it's taught from the pulpit or from the lectern, I would not say that such a person is disqualified from membership in a professional 1689 church. And similarly, if, if someone had a, a few disagreements about uh, the whole issue of the Christian Sabbath, as long as their practice did not disturb the unity piece of the church, and as long as their practice was consistent with the requirements of the church of its members in terms of attendance of the meeting, meetings of the church, I wouldn't take uh, those kind of uh, intellectual questions and confusion as barring a person membership in the local church. And that gives you a couple of examples of my view of that. Yeah, that would be very helpful for all of us at the same time. We, we have also read uh, from David Ortland's book, what we call Theological Triage. Um, this is uh, actually knowing what he has just said, uh, the first time about the foundational and the non-foundational truths, although they are truths in a way, but still, um, if, if it does not disrupt the identity of the needs of the church, then we can... Uh, you have used a while ago the term um, although the members um, may not fully subscribe to the confession in itself, but um, they have, in a way, as, as they are inside the church, submit to it, right? Yes. Yeah. Let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about from another authority sphere. Um, uh, a woman has to agree to submit to her husband. That's a biblical uh, non-negotiable requirement. But if we made such submission mean agreeing with him at all times and always, a marriage would become impossible. Submission does not require uh, agreement with everything. It requires a sufficient amount of agreement that one can submit. Uh, and similarly, uh, 
a submission to the uh, membership in a local church does not require absolute agreement with the elders or with everything in the confession of faith, but it does require sufficient agreement so that a person completely and peaceably, peaceably submit to that confession. Thank you very much, Brother J. Real. Were you satisfied with that? Uh, with those words? Yeah, that, that's a, that's actually a, a, a very helpful uh, answer, and I have been longing to ask Dr. Waldron about, about that. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Waldron. I'm Brother Joseph. Do you still have something to maybe to ask or to add on? I, if I could ask, uh, I, I want to put uh, a twist on the question. So perhaps there are people watching. Who are not pastors or preachers so they do not have uh, teaching influence in the church and they are coming to know of the uh, the utility uh, the, the usefulness of uh, confession for the life of the church uh, for the faithfulness of the church to its mandate but they belong in a church uh, that is not really confession so uh, doctor what would you advise uh, would you advice that that person should find another church or uh, how should that person begin to kind of influence the church towards being a confessional one if that person uh, doesn't really hold any teaching or preaching function in the church yeah that's a great question and a difficult question and it depends a lot on circumstances but i i would say if a church were really and truly not professional uh, anti-confessional I think my my counsel would almost universally be uh, leave that church and find a church that is clear and specific in its commitment to the truth of the Bible um, you know like the saying goes the devil is always in the details and circumstances might in a few cases change that if they have a person uh, uh, was a, a pillar of the church and he were not an officer but he had the ear of people and he had the opportunity to teach I might I might uh, uh, encourage him to try to bring that church into a uh, confessional confessional uh, situation but in most cases I've been familiar with uh, that's that's really a lost cause it's going to do uh, the person more harm than good. It's going to create more grief and satisfaction, and and they really should uh, find a church and support a church with their time, their attendance, their money that actually stands for the truth of God's word, and not one that is so wishy washy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sam. And we come now to our last um, point. In fact, this is for my brothers. My brothers will be asking and clarifying some things with you. And we will end with uh, with them. We won't leave um, unclarified tonight. Brother J. Rel and Brother Joseph has uh, questions for you. Um, but I will just um, add a little bit um, here before we move to the, to the last point. I, I am personally helped by these brothers. Our brother JRL and brother Joseph has actually helped me in 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 seeing the beauty of, of confessional of confessionalism or fatalism. Um, we just started uh, the church um, last year around December, and we stopped January because of the quarantine process here in the city, and then came back um, on February. But I would always go back to the to the personal involvement with these guys, JRL and um, Brother Joseph, who themselves were actually thankful for you, Doctor Sam. Uh, they they were they. They, they would always tell me that um, they were helped by, by you. So this is um, this discussion tonight. I myself am an example of a of someone, especially here in the local church, who started a church and made it a professional church because of these guys helping me out. So this is an illustration in itself. Yeah. So move to the last point. The last point is simply. Um, clarifications and uh, takeaway summaries. Um, br our brothers here had some questions. Brother J. Rel, do you have a question so that we can clarify everything before we leave? 
I think I have already asked that question that I really want to 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 ask, and I think Pastor Joseph has a question. About, <laughs> I know that about question. specific uh, specifics on the but confession. <laughs> or if you you're going to uh, ask that. Uh, we we were just uh, joking about this earlier, but okay, we uh, we would like to ask you, uh, what do you think of? Uh, well, uh, we know you have it. You have a footnote on that on your fifth revision, uh, chapter seven of the covenant uh, of the confession, covenant theology. So, <laughs> can, can, what are your thoughts about right now? Uh, well, what are your thoughts about 1689 federalism? Oh uh, well, I, I've I've been thankful and I've learned many things uh, with the development of 1689 federalism, and uh, uh, and I guess as since I, you know, published uh, the book, a modern exposition 40 years ago, uh, and and I, I've admitted some of those uh, uh, changes and appreciation for 1689 federalism in uh, in a footnote in the fifth edition. Um, I'm much more uh, clear in my commitment uh, to the covenant of works. I've always been committed to that. I'm much more comfortable with the, with the traditional language of a covenant of life and covenant of works uh, that uh, uh, has been used historically. Uh, so from my view, my view in substance hasn't changed on that issue, but uh, I have I have become more comfortable with the terminology that summarizes it in the reform tradition. And I also uh, have been helped and I'm uh, moving toward the view that the covenant of grace is the new covenant. And uh, I don't know that the, I can say, I don't think the confession is actually explicit about that. It certainly the, says the covenant of grace is fully revealed in the new covenant, but I'm more inclined to that position as well. Uh, but to be perfectly honest, the thing about 1689 federalism that is most difficult for me and, and which I really don't have clarity about is is uh, the whole the tendency of 1689 federalism to describe the Mosaic Covenant as a covenant of work. Um, that's, uh, yeah, I, I think I share the, uh, uh, the diversity of the reform tradition on that issue. Which you know, some of some have said it's uh, an administration of the covenant of grace. Some have said it's a covenant of works. Some have said it's a mixed covenant, and I, I still have a lot of questions about that and the whole issue of republicanism. Uh, I think Cornelius Venema, in an article online, uh, makes the point that there is not just one view of republication, but a number of views of republication. Uh, that is to say, the republication of the law, or the government of works, and the Mosaic Covenant. And uh, I, I might hold one of the milder forms of that, but the bald statement that the Mosaic Covenant was the government of works uh, troubles me a great deal. And uh, and so uh, you asked, and that's my answer. Uh, I don't know how satisfying it is, but that's that's my. Those are the things that I've. I've uh, been thinking about for the last 10 or 15 years. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Brother General, do you still have something to say? Uh, no, I, I don't have anything to say. Thank you, Dr. Waldron, for your answers. And it's been very helpful for us. Thank yeah. you, brother. So, so if we would um, uh, wrap it all up, we would say that being a confessional church is it's really helpful, beneficial for both personal and corporate worship, even in evangelism and in missions. So, um, Dr. Walder, we would like to grab this moment to thank you. And at the same time, we, we would like to ask you to promote your uh, the seminary wherein you are in right now. <laughs> well, uh, you know, Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary uh, has been greatly blessed by God. And one of the things I want to make the point is uh, that uh, we're available to anybody in the world. Uh, we can, uh, uh, because we're basically a distant educational institution, and we try to we try to give people a fine theological education 
with well-known and well-qualified professors and, and do it in a way that allows people to stay in their churches, stay in their jobs, not uproot their families. And we try to provide this uh, at a cost that uh, is uh, reasonable and doable and doesn't leave uh, seminary students with tens of thousands of dollars of debt. What a ridiculous idea that a, that a pastor should leave seminary with that much debt. And I also will say that we are very much desirous of reaching out uh, to our, our brothers and those who want to study in other countries. And we've developed scholarship programs that are specifically intended for brothers who live in a different co economy than we enjoy here in the United States. And we want to make sure that uh, that the uh, the cost of, of of being able to provide such training, we want to make sure that that's not a factor in why people can't uh, come and, and take those courses. So those are some of the things I'd like to say about that. I think we lost uh, Brother Twister. Uh, I'm I'm sure he's trying to get back. Uh, brother, uh, brother Gerald, maybe you have a question as we are waiting for Brother Twister. Uh, is that okay? <laughs> Actually, I have a lot. Of, uh, I have a lot of questions, but uh, we are now in the top of hour. Uh, maybe you have uh, work, Doctor Waldron, since yeah. it's Monday. But uh, I think yeah. Uh, Brother Twister, na cut, uh, he, he, he was cut. I think his internet is not stable there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank so, you, brothers. I appreciate your sensitivity to my time. Let me just close. I, I can say one thing that has kind of been on my heart to say. You know, uh, our confession of faith is a big confession, but it's it's also a deliberately limited confession. There are issues which they did, did deliberately did not decide upon or, or, or uh, make uh, rules about, if I can put it that way, in the confession of faith. Uh, and you can see that at several points. Uh, I, I, the whole issue that was much disputed among Baptists in the 1600s and 1700s of open membership versus closed membership or open communion versus closed communion uh, with regard to non-baptized members as I as is from my point of view not decided in the confession and so I that doesn't mean that we can have no convictions or even positions as a church that are not uh, stated in the confession I think we have to make clear what they are in our constitutions but it, it is important to realize that our confession is deliberately limited. And when our own convictions as a church, as a pastor, uh, take us beyond the confession of faith, we just have to make sure that, uh, that that's not a bad thing. The Bible teaches more than is in the confession of faith. But we have to make sure that we are, uh, one, very careful about those convictions and also a very a very cautious about dividing fellowship with people over such convictions that are not uh, clarified in the confession of faith. Uh, it's not to say that there aren't things that are important that I think we should hold as a church. It's not to say that the confession of faith shouldn't uh, isn't subject to being uh, clarified and added to. It's a human document after all a wonderful human document, a very useful human document, but that means that it's, 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 uh, it's always subject to improvement as the understanding of the church uh, moves on in the development of doctrine in the church. All right, thank you very much. I actually don't know what was, <laughs> what was being asked here, but I am praising God for, for you guys. Shall we end now? Is it okay? Yes. Yeah. And um, to those who are watching and to those who are here, to those who are churches, I know I have seen um, pastors, leaders who, uh, who have just watched us here online and will still continue to watch us in the future because this is recorded. 
we would like to to praise God for this. We would like to thank um, Dr. Samuel Waldron, who has just celebrated uh, his birthday this week, right? How old are you, Dr. Waldron? Okay, don't answer that. <laughs> no, I can, I'll answer it. I'm 70, okay. but I, okay. I tell everybody that 70 is the new 50. Okay, so 70 is the new 50. And okay. thank you very much for, for, all those, for all these years that you have been um, standing on the confessions because you have uh, you love um, the word of God. We thank you so much for, for everyone. We hope that you have been blessed. You, we hope that you have been um, taught well. We hope that you also have been challenged because some of you who are watching here may just be thinking if um, being confessional is, is really beneficial or helpful or even to the question that of its necessity. And we have answered these questions for you. And we hope and pray that the Lord will actually strengthen you and give you the wisdom to do in accordance to his word. Thank you very much. And God bless you, everyone. Amen. Thank you, brothers. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Dr.